2016, it was a three-ring circus of election meddling. Russian trolls had been busy making mischief on the internet. They were using fake accounts, fake organizations, and finally, fake local media. Russian intelligence hacking the DNC. They were not hacking the Trump campaign. In the alleged collusion. Let's instead use the word seduction. You have Russia saying we want to help you. And you have Don Jr. saying love it. Of course Russians prefer Trump because Trump said that he preferred Russians. Russia was not pro-Trump. They were anti-America. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post, and welcome to Washington Post Live. Russia's alleged interference in the 2016 presidential election is the subject of a two-part HBO documentary entitled Agents of Chaos. Here to discuss the film and the facts that are its focus are its Academy Award-winning and Emmy Award-winning director, Alex Gibney, and Camille Francois, the chief information, chief information officer at Graphica, where she leads the company's work to detect and mitigate disinformation, media manipula manipulation, and harassment. I'm speaking too fast for myself. Alex, Camille, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for thank having you. us. So Alex, I'm gonna start with you. You set out to make a documentary about Donald Trump's ties to, to Russia and the Russian government. Can you describe the extent of the connections that you found and how far back do they go? Well, I, I should say that, that the original goal of the doc was to really look into the Russian attack. Uh, and, and that's what part one focuses on. And then we wanted to see to what extent people in the Trump orbit or Trump campaign cooperated with that attack. So. Um, while we did look somewhat at, at, at Trump's ties to Russia going way back, that was not the focus of our investigation. Well, then, since the title of the, the documentary is Agents of Chaos, what makes President Trump an agent of chaos? <laughs> well, that is a good question. And, and I think that that was the sense of it. In other words, I believe that the Russians didn't um, put their weight behind Trump because they were interested in his policies. I think they put their weight behind him because they were interested in, in him as an agent of chaos. And to some extent, that's just who he is. He is he's very able um, to uh, use chaos to his great advantage, both in terms of amassing power, to confuse people, to distract people. He lives in that world uh, in a way that's very comfortable for him. And I think that that was one of the things that um, the Russians were intrigued by, even though through most of the campaign, I don't think they had any belief or understanding that he would actually win. I think the ultimate aim was to uh, discredit um, uh, democracy and also to uh, play to their own domestic audience uh, and enhance, um, enhance themselves as a superpower by tweaking the nose of another superpower. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one more question for you, Alex, at the risk of imploding the sequence of questions that I have for you, but I'm dying to, to ask this question now. And that is, given what you set out to do with this documentary, now that, now that you've been through it, it's complete. Was there anything that completely surprised you that you didn't see coming as a result of your work? Two things. One was I didn't fully appreciate when I started uh, just how, uh, just what the history of just what the history of um, Russian interference was. And it really goes back to uh, Putin's re-election in 2012 and how much criticized he was by, by Hillary Clinton, and also the way that the Russians sharpened their cyber, cyber tools in the um, attack on Ukraine in, uh, in 2014. The other thing that really surprised me was how much the... Uh, how wrong many people got the story on this side uh, of the pond. And that is they kept deducing political motives when I think most of the motives were purely financial. I think, you know, Donald Trump for most of um, the presidential campaign was simply interested in getting a Moscow Trump Tower deal done. And he thought by saying nice things about Vladimir Putin, that would help in that goal. 
Um, and I also think that people like Paul Manafort, who joined the campaign as a uh, for free as a campaign manager, um, wasn't uh, pursuing some um, mysterious political goal. He just wanted to get out of a debt that he owed to uh, a Russian oligarch named Oleg Deripaska. So there was a kind of corruption and venality embedded in the campaign, which sought to exacerbate this whole notion of chaos that I think is really important to understand. Camille, you were engaged by the U.S. Senate to study the activities of the infamous Russian troll farms. And in the film, you talk about the, the three different types of online personas Russia used to, to do this. Uh, t tell us about them, the three. Yeah, so it, it's interesting what we uh, looked at in 2017. The Senate Select Intelligence Committee gave us the data of the activity of the troll farms on three different platforms, right? On Twitter, on Facebook, uh, and on Google. And so we took a step back and tried to understand, okay, what does this entire campaign look like? And we found fake activists, we found fake uh, news organization, uh, and we find fake fake people, fake influencers. But what's interesting is how all of this worked together as a system for many years to target the divisive and polarizing topics in the American conversation and to create chaos and division uh, using social media. So Camille, by the, time the, by the time the Russians turned their attentions on the United States, they had already had some practice, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're the expert here, they already had some practice when it came to Ukraine and Crimea, no? They also had practice on their own people. They had used social media to control their own domestic uh, sphere of online information. I think we also forget that they turned their attention to the US fairly early on. They start in 2014. The thing that I discovered uh, back in 2017 when we look at this data for the first time is I'm realizing it's not just about 2016, right? They started targeting the US at least two years prior and they didn't stop after the election. Um, as a matter of fact, the amount of, of messages that those accounts produce increases after the 2016 election. So in 2017, they doubled down. So that's that's interesting. One of the things um, th those of us in, in, in my business talk about is the fact that President Trump, President Trump's presidential campaign didn't end on election night or even on inauguration day. It kept going. So from what you're telling us now, the, the Rus Russians propaganda campaign just kept going even after President Trump won election and was inaugurated. That's right. It kept going in 2017. And in 2017, the major Silicon Valley platforms start, uh, you know, trying to get more serious at detecting this type of activity and turning it off. And so that forces the IRA in response to adapt its techniques and to try out new ways to target and to manipulate American audiences. And we kind of see their evolution from 2017 onwards, right? They do come back for the midterms in 2018. They come back again in 2019. And honestly, the last time we saw a, an operation that was targeted at the US and that was affiliated with the IRA was a handful of weeks ago, uh, just in August. Right. You know, I would have, you're talking about the, the, the focus of the Russians and their propaganda campaign obviously got me to thinking about their efforts at targeting African American voters as part of their, uh, as part of their chaos. And, and Alex, um, why did Russia target black voters? Did, did the troll, the troll farms, did they have any impact on voter turnout, do you think? I think they did have impact on voter turnout. We can't quantify it, um, but I think they did. It's important to note that I wouldn't say they just targeted African-American voters. I think they looked for issues that were extremely divisive. And, uh, you know, there is no more uh, heated issue in this country than the issue of race. They also looked at immigration. That was also a very, very much of a touch point. And they end up amplifying heated voices on 
both sides of, of the issue. So they would um, inflame passions is what they were looking to do. And I think that in terms of voter turnout, what they hoped for was that they would engender a sense of general disgust with the entire system and thereby actually encourage people. And in some cases, they actually did encourage people not to vote because the system was so deeply corrupt. You know, one of the reasons why I asked that question is in my own research for a column I did last month, discover, or a couple months ago, discovering that in Detroit alone, 50,000 African-American voters fewer voted in 2016 than they did in 2012, and Hillary Clinton lost Michigan by 10,721 votes. So the idea that the Russians were, you know, targeting divisive issues, targeting African Americans, um, is something that I think Americans should should pay attention to and take heed of. Um, I'm going to make this a jump ball. Do you think that the American government is fully engaged, prepared, and ready to fight back the efforts that are bound to intensify in the last forty-something days of the campaign? Camille, Camille, I have a, Camille why go don't ahead, you go? go ahead, Alex. Okay, Camille, you go. <laughs> um, we have seen some progress um, since the last election on a few things. I think that it's fair to say that in 2016, the government got really caught flat footed. It didn't strategically think about uh, social media interference as a major threat. And that was also the case throughout Silicon Valley. We've seen a different attitude. We've seen, for instance, in 2018, the government uh, catching some new interference attempts and then sharing this information with Silicon Valley in order for an invest in investigation to rapidly take place and for the, uh, for the fake accounts to rapidly go down. We've seen this again um, last month with another uh, tip from law enforcement that was shared across Silicon Valley. They had detected a website that was in fact Russian, but posing to be an independent news source. So I think that we have seen some form of progress with a real involvement um, of certain parts of the American governments that are, that are, that mm -hmm. are trying to take the issue seriously. Yeah, the, the, you know, what I was going to raise, the whole idea of when you say government, what do you mean? I mean, there are aspects of this administration that are not particularly interested in um, curtailing um, Russian interference, I believe. And furthermore, um, I think one of the things that you saw in 2016 and that you're seeing now again in 2020, in 2016, um, Donald Trump was very active in saying that if he was going to lose, it meant that the election was rigged. And we know that the Russians in 2016 embedded themselves or sought to get into uh, election systems in every state in the union uh, in order to be able not to flip votes, because that's not so very easy, but to cast doubt on the uh, ultimate result. And everyone assumed for the longest time that that would be Hillary. Well, once again, you see Donald Trump casting doubt in 2020 on, um, on on whether or not the elections will be fair, particularly if he doesn't win. And I believe you're going to see uh, Russian incursions into election systems in order to buttress that point of view from President Trump. So, so Alex, I just want to make sure I'm, fo I'm following you correctly. The Russians embedded themselves in state election systems for the, mm -hmm. for the sole purpose not to flip votes, but to just sort of be there to sort of enhance the allegation that the that the election was fraudulent. That's correct. Because of, the, okay. In other words, it's very hard to um, it's very hard to flip votes in a way that is going to have the desired impact. You can't have suddenly everybody in a town or in a county voting for one candidate. You have to flip just enough in order to, to win, but not to make it look like you're doing it. And, and it's a very decentralized system. It's hard to do that across the board. But what you can do is, um, is create irregularities in systems across the country and thereby raise questions as to whether or not the uh, results were legitimate. That, I believe, is what they were trying to do in 2016. And I suspect that they may try to do the same thing in 2020, though Camille is probably more on top of that than I am. Yeah, Camille, I know you wanted to jump in. 
I, I can I can yeah add a, a little bit more detail on what we've seen them do in the last election cycle. We've seen at least three different campaigns um, affiliated with the IRA that focused on 2020. Um, the last the first one we saw was detected in October. It was a, a very odd campaign focused on using Instagram and on reusing some of the memes that they had used in 2016. Hmm. Then we saw another campaign that was detected this time in uh, March that was based in Ghana. And this time, um, an individual who was associated with the IRA used activists in Ghana who unwittingly participated in a campaign to target African-American voters on social media using, for instance, the hashtag uh, Black History Month that happened quite a bit and not just in, in February. And, and as I was saying, just recently in August, we saw one new attempt of this time targeting um, more progressive and socialist audiences in the US with this website who was also recruiting freelancers who did not have awareness that the website was in fact run by uh, the Russians. So we have seen these techniques come again uh, and with sort of the same uh, the same underlying principles of uh, dividing audiences, of creating chaos and um, uh, undermining trust in, in specific candidates. You know, we've talked a lot about what happened in 2016 and what they're doing in 2020. And Alex, you reveal in the film, and I think Camille, you talked about this at the beginning of our, our conversation about the FBI and uh, American intelligence seeing what the Russians were doing since 2014. And so the question I think a lot of people have had is once U.S. intelligence found out about about these activities and Russia's future intentions, why weren't they able to respond to put a stop to it? That's a really good question. Uh, and, the, and the answer is, uh, is complicated. I mean, there were people in the U.S. government who were very much um, advising the president and those around him that uh, that the United States should strike back, or at the very least, notify the American public that an attack was underway. And they didn't do either of those things. Uh, and this and now at one point, President Obama reached out uh, or literally sp uh, spoke to Vladimir Putin um, in person and warned him that if he attempted to try to flip votes, and we were talking about that earlier. He would effectively destroy Russia's economy. So that was a threat that was made, but there were no cyber. Um, there was no cyber response, and no uh, until it was very late in the campaign. No uh, uh, public campaign to let the American people know what was really happening. And, and you're quite right that that the FBI, in particular, was following Russian cyber activities um, starting in 2014 and ultimately brought an indictment against some of them. They were concerned. It, it started out of a, an office in Pittsburgh that was looking into um, a nuclear reactor that had been hacked in Ukraine. And the reason it was in Pittsburgh is because that's the headquarters of Westinghouse, and Westinghouse builds mm. a lot of nuclear reactors. So obviously, this was, you know, when you're talking about hacking into nuclear reactors, you're talking about serious business. Camille, let's talk about, about money here, because the Russian troll farms, they don't work for Putin, but they do take direction from him or, or do his bidding. So then who's the source of the funding for the, for the Internet Research Agency, or is the IRA, as you've been calling it? Yeah, it's an interesting question, because I think sometimes we overfocus on the IRA, like if it was the only player in the Russian disinformation ecosystem. But in reality, that's not the case. You have some of these troll farms, and when you think about it, those troll farms, they're, they're structured almost as a sort of marketing agency, right? They have a search engine optimization department, a graphics department, and therefore uh, they, they, they're, they're run a little bit more like a madman and a little bit less like Homeland, right? And on the other side of the spectrum, you do have uh, Russian military intelligence that are also running the fake accounts, that are also doing some of the hacking. And this is sort of a very different approach to uh, Russian disinformation. So the first thing is you don't just have this one troll farm. You have an entire ecosystem of different uh, actors and different players. They're all funded differently. 
but in the case uh, in the case of the IRA, that's a good question for for Alex too, because um, we know how much the IRA relates to a whole bunch of other geopolitical activities around the world because of its funder. And uh, Alex, uh, answer Camille's question, and but also talk about what the motives are of the people who work for the work for the IRA. So. Um, to answer um, the the question that Camille put to me, I mean, the person who runs the IRA or who controls the IRA is a man named Evgeny Prigozhin. He's a former hot dog salesman who ultimately made his money um, by getting huge government catering contact, contracts from Vladimir Putin. He failed up magnificently. Every step along the way, there were huge complaints about how bad his food was. And we show, you know... Uh, <laughs> We show a clip from the film of a soldier. You know, ultimately he 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 would feed huge portions of the uh, Russian military. We show a soldier turning a plate upside down, and and the food doesn't leave the plate; it's stuck to the bottom of it. So, you know, Prigozhin got the uh, franchise for a lot of this. He was he benefited enormously um, through these government contracts, and as a result, he tends to do favors for Vladimir Putin. But, Vla but Yevgeny Prigozhin isn't just about the troll factory. He also controls a rather impressive mercenary force called mm -hmm. the Wagner, which has tanks, which has missiles, and which do uh, terrible mischief, sometimes murderous mischief, all over the world. You know, uh, Alex, at the beginning of the conversation, you, you mentioned um, the, uh, what was it, the, 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 financial, the financial ties and especially you know, the looking for doing a Moscow, a Trump Tower in Moscow. You, I want to play a clip because you take viewers behind the scenes of negotiations during the 2020 campaign to build a Trump Tower in Moscow. And you, we're going to show an excerpt of an interview that you did with Felix Carter, who is the man who was entrusted with getting the deal done in Russia. Everyone have a watch. Our first project was Trump Phoenix. And then we did Trump Fort Lauderdale, we did the Trump Soho, we looked at doing Trump London, Trump Paris, Trump Istanbul. We're developing real estate, we're developing Trump Towers. And if Russian buyers had bought some units, well, you know what they say, any customer whose check clears is a good customer. But I wasn't bringing Russian money into the Trump Organization. Never have, not one dollar or not one ruble. <laughs> That's the question. The Republicans they say about my people the polls. I will suspend my campaign. Suspend, we are suspending our campaign, campaign as of this moment. Without an ounce of regret. Deeper faith that the Lord will show me the way forward. You know, there's a lot of people who love me. They just won't vote for me, but it's okay. It's not a problem. But let's be honest, too, about all this. The media has given these personal attacks that Donald Trump has made an incredible amount of coverage. The press wouldn't stop writing about him. You know, he was getting a lot of ink worldwide. I was sitting in my backyard reading the news on my iPad, and it just dawned on me. I said, wow, this would be the perfect time. I think we could get a Trump Tower Moscow deal done. I called Michael Cohen, said I want to come by and talk. My vision was building the tallest building in Europe. I actually used to dream about making it the tallest building in the world. It's a billion dollar deal. Absolutely. And so, Alex, why didn't that Trump Tower Moscow deal go through? I'm not sure. Um, in part, I think they put it on pause because suddenly Donald Trump was running for president. And it never really went away. That's something that most people really don't know or understand. It was still on the table up to the moment when he became president, which which surprised him, surprised Putin, surprised everybody. But I think they they put the deal on pause or on hold while Trump ran for president. Um, and so uh, that's why I think is the simple answer to that question. But it, it, the deal never went away. And the presumption was that when Trump ultimately lost, which was the expectation, they would just resume the deal. You know, an, another question for you, Alex. Um, you let's talk about the FBI's investigation into Trump campaign officials. You interviewed former F, acting FBI uh, director Andrew McCabe, who told you 
that there, quote, uh, is, quote, no organization in D.C. that had more of an impact on helping Donald Trump get elected than the FBI. What did he mean by that? Well, he's talking about Jim Comey, and he's talking about uh, Comey's um, letter to Congress in which he revealed that they were going back in to um, reinvestigate Hillary Clinton's emails at a critical point in the campaign. Um, so, and, and he was trying to put the kibosh on the often made um, uh, accusation that the FBI was the deep state um, actively trying to uh, undermine the Trump campaign throughout 2016. That's just not true. As he says, maybe the most consequential um, action late in the campaign was Comey's uh, vocal reopening of the Hillary Clinton email investigation, which cost her grievously, and that probably uh, cost her the presidency. Um, we've got less than five minutes left, but I want to play one more clip from the documentary Agents of Chaos. Uh, this is an excerpt from an interview, Alex, you did with Andrew Weissman, who is the lead prosecutor on the Mueller team. Let's take a watch. People like to think of the special counsel's office as a witch hunt, but this is just not a partisan issue. Our report has one key finding, clear, unequivocal efforts by the Russian government to interfere with our election. The issue that goes to the core of our democracy is are we doing everything we can to make sure that Americans will decide who is running this country? And so the, the last question that Mr. Weissman asks, are we doing everything we can to make sure Americans are deciding who runs this country? I'm going to put that question to the two of you to, to close this out. Camille, I'll start with you. From your, from your vantage point as the chief information officer at Graphica, is the United States, is the United States government doing everything it can to make sure Americans are deciding who runs this, this country? We talked about how difficult it is to talk about the you know US government as as a whole. They are parts that I think are trying really hard and there are statements that I do believe have been counterproductive. But I think overall it's also not just a government problem. It's going to be a whole of society approach. It's going to be a problem for the platforms. It's going to be a problem for the media having to think through how do you report in an age of Russian disinformation in the middle of, of the election. I think that we are in a much better position than what we were four years ago. But the trick, of course, is that the adversary has changed and has adapted. The Russian techniques that are used now are quite different uh, than what it looked like in 2016. So we're now in a game of uh, cat and mouse and, and chase where we have to adapt to the, the latest that's going to come our way. And I do believe it's going to be a whole of society approach. Mm -hmm. Alex, in this cat and mouse game, are we the, is the United States the cat or the mouse? In a weird way, I think we're both. I, I'd like to pick up on something Camille said in the documentary. She said that there was nothing that the Russians did, particularly in their social media campaigns, which injected anything new into the American uh, political economy. What they did was to exacerbate serious and grievous problems that we have in this country, particularly a, a, a sense of divisiveness and a lack of trust in our fundamental institutions. So we've got to get that back. The best thing that we could do to, defer, to deter future Russian attacks is to get our act together here in this country. And with that, Alex Gibney, and, and I've learned the correct pronunciation of your name, Camille, Camille Francois. Thank you both very much for joining us today. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, Agents of Chaos premieres on HBO and HBO Max this Wednesday, September 23rd at 9 p.m. Eastern. Part two of the documentary will air the following evening at the same time. If you'd like to watch highlights from today's program or watch the full interview, head over to WashingtonPostLive.com, where you can also see our calendar of events for this week. 
Come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern when I'll interview MJ Hagar, Democratic candidate for Senate in Texas for a special K-Pop Live in conjunction with the Texas Tribune Festival. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post, and this has been Washington Post Live.